Good evening, everybody. Hopefully this is a decent volume. Luke, is this a cool enough volume? Or Brandy? All right, that's awesome. Thank you, guys. Welcome back. We're back live again, which is an awesome feeling that we can be out here again. Glad numbers are dropping and we can successfully be out here and have the blessing from our department, and et cetera. Um, so tonight, we have Sam Smith with us. Sam is, um, well, she hails from Lexington, Massachusetts. And she did her undergrad at Harvard, where she had her first research experience studying uh, bat embryology, bat and embryology, awesome. And after she graduated, she spent a few years in industry and then found her way back to UT in the Phelps lab that studies uh, specific species of singing mice, which is pretty cool. She's generally interested in how these complex traits form, like, uh, like, uh, like in bright coloration or vocal production, and she's mainly interested in the mechanics behind them. And her dissertation focuses on these mechanics and how the singing mouse is able to combine its vocal and respiratory physiology to produce that actual sound. And what's cool about that is these singing mice actually produce uh, mating calls in the ultrasonic, which is pretty amazing. And so normally we can't hear them, but we have the tech to slow it down to actually do that. And tonight, Sam is actually going to be talking to us about what to expect when you're an expecting animal. So ladies and gentlemen, Sam Smith. Thank you, Kyle. Um, let me just make sure. Okay, great, it works. Um, yeah, so today I'm going to be talking to you about a subject that I'm not researching currently um, in grad school, but it's just something that I found so interesting for um, ever since I started to learn about it in college. Um, so we are going to talk today about the different ways that animals um, develop and um, we're just starting here with a nice image of a turtle and the eggs that it has not yet laid. Okay, <laughs> great start. Um, okay, so I want to just start by um, kind of defining two modes of reproduction that we tend to think about. Um, so we think about two different ways that an animal can develop. Um, as an embryo, that's just a developing animal that's not fully formed yet. Um, they can either develop in an egg, um, like this chicken egg here, or they can develop in their mother. Um, like what humans do. And we call this oviparity when they lay eggs and we call it viviparity when they um, develop in the mother and the mother gives live birth to a live um, baby. Let's see if this will work. Thank you, Winnie. You're welcome. Um, <laughs> okay, so before we, we really dive into it, I wanna start by um, just taking a little poll here, playing a little game. Um, so, I'm going to show you an animal, and I'd like you to raise your left hand um, 
if you think it lays an egg, or raise your right hand if you think it gives live birth. Okay. okay, so what about a goldfish? Okay, I see a lot of left hands here. Yes, so it lay. Yes. Um, okay, so it lays eggs. Um, there may have been a right hand in there somewhere, which was a good intuition because there are actually some fish, not goldfish, but other fish that do give live birth. So for example, there is, I don't know if you're doing it or I'm doing, I'm doing it. it. Okay, great. Um, there is a group of fish called um, the Pisleid fish, which actually some people here um, on campus study um, that do give live birth. So not all fish lay eggs. Okay, how about birds? Okay, that was fast, yeah. Birds <laughs> lay eggs, right? And actually every bird lays eggs. There's no birds that give live birth. And this is also true of alligators and animals as well. Okay, what about a lion? Great, great job. <laughs> yes, they give live birth. <laughs> um, and this is the case for almost every mammal, right? Almost all mammals give live birth except for a couple weird mammals, including um, a platypus, for example. There's a couple mammals that lay eggs. Okay, let's do one more. What about this green tree python? Okay, I'm seeing a lot of left hands. Yeah, okay, and maybe a, maybe a right hand in there. So these guys do lay eggs, but maybe a some of you thought there are other snakes that do give live birth. So for example, pit vipers um, give live birth. Okay, so the point of this exercise that you guys did very well on is that there is a lot of, of variation in how animals um, develop, whether they develop in an egg or in their, in their mother. Um, but there are many ways in which animals do things that are totally unexpected. So for example, it's not always the female that is carrying the developing young. So these are pipefish, they're related to seahorses, which many of you may know, um, carry the eggs of their young. So after fertilization, the female will deposit the eggs into a little pouch um, on the male, and, those, and that male will protect those eggs until they hatch. So they will hatch inside that pouch and then they will um they'll come out of the pouch once they've once they're fully formed and hatched so this is a video um from natural geographic of a male seahorse helping or expelling the um that hatched seahorses i think oh yeah okay oh. so they're going to come out right there right there <laughs> It kind of looks weird, right? Um, and there are a ton of them in there, right? And they're just helping push them out. Kind of like giving birth, but a male from a pouch. There are other weird ways in which um, parents will protect their eggs until they hatch. And one of those is in the gas brooding frogs. There's two species of these, or were, I believe they've gone extinct, um, sadly. But the mother will swallow fertilized eggs and she will keep them in her stomach where they will develop until, um, until they hatch <laughs> and they will come out of her mouth. So this is a picture of a uh, frog, a little froglet inside, um, the, inside its mother's mouth. And what's pretty cool about this is that normally when you eat food, there is acid that gets secreted into your that's in your stomach that helps you digest the food, right? And that would be really harmful to these developing eggs. And so these mothers will actually not produce that acid and they will um, not eat for the whole period of time that they're, uh, that they're, I guess, pregnant, you could say. Um, and then they'll start eating again after the frogs all come out of her mouth. <laughs> okay, so we just talked about two examples um, of animals that um, where the embryos are developing in eggs in kind of unexpected places. And these embryos are all 
getting all of the nutrients and energy that they need to grow into a fully formed individual from the, the nutrients that are already in the egg, and that we call that yolk. Um, but there are many species, especially those that um, give live birth, that um, the mother is actively providing nutrients for the um, embryo. It's not coming from an egg. So one example of this is um, in this uh, pseudoscorpion. You can click next. Um, so these are related to scorpions, but they're not exactly scorpions because they don't have that kind of stinger on their, on their butt. Um, but they do look a lot like a scorpion, right? Um, and they are related. And so um, when they're pregnant, they uh, keep their eggs in a brood sac and those embryos will develop. Um, and to help uh, those embryos get the energy they need to um, develop, they will secrete yolk, the same thing that's found in the egg, um, directly to these developing embryos. Um, you can click next. Early in development, um, the yolk is just directly absorbed into the embryo's body, but then later on in development, the embryos have to use a special organ to ingest the yolk because they've formed their cuticle. That's that hard shell that's on the outside of things like scorpions. Another way that embryos can get nutrition is from eating other eggs or embryos in the womb. So this is a sand tiger shark, and this happens in multiple shark species. Um, and these guys give live birth. Um, they have two uteruses, um, one on each side, and they'll have multiple eggs that are uh, fertilized in each uterus. Um, these, uh, they will then kind of develop off of the, uh, the yolk in the egg until a certain stage. And the first one that reaches that stage will actually hatch out of that egg inside the uterus and then eat all of the other eggs. <laughs> Um, so this is um, an image from the contents of a uterus. So this is a sand tiger shark that died of natural causes that researchers were able to get and open up the uterus. And so what they've found here um, is these are egg capsules. So inside these eggs are were developing embryos. That is a hatchling. So this is um, an embryo that grew the fastest and then hatched out and started to eat the other eggs. And then that's an embryo, that <laughs> last one. So you can see how much bigger the hatchling is than the embryo. So this, um, in the normal case, um, the hatchling will continue until it eats everything that's in the uterus. And then the mother will actually continue to um, ovulate or, or um, deposit eggs into the uterus that that hatchling will continue to eat until it's ready to be born. So at the end of development, the sand tiger shark will have two, will give birth to two sharks, one from each uterus. And this is a really um, interesting strategy that allows um, the sharks to grow really big um, before they're born. And that helps protect them from potential predators when, um, when they're first born. Um, so these guys don't really get eaten by that much, even right when they're born, because they're already so big. So there's another kind of cool story about sharks. Sharks are amazing. Um, this is a, a tawny nurse shark in an aquarium. And um, these guys actually also have the same type of development that sand tiger sharks do. And um, what they found is that these embryos are so developed that they're actually swimming around in the uterus before they're born. So this is a researcher who is um, doing an ultrasound on this shark. So ultrasounds are things that, you know, hu pregnant humans get to, you know, make sure everything's looking okay with, the, with their developing baby and sometimes to find out the sex. And um, we have figured out a way to make ultrasounds work underwater, which I think is amazing. Um, and when they did this, what they found was that this shark was swimming around in there. So on top is a picture or still images from the ultrasound. So, and then below here is a, a sort of a diagram of what that looks like because it can be a little bit hard to see. Um, 
but this is a diagram of what the uterus looks like. So there's one on the left side, one on the right side. And what they saw was that the, the embryonic shark was squeezing its way between the two uteruses and swimming back and forth. So we can actually watch a video of this. Um, so before, so this is the head, the upper body, and then the tail, which is pretty cool. So the other thing before you play this, um, that's pretty uh, crazy is this is a video of the same type of shark um, with the embryo that you can actually see poking its little face out of the mother shark. So it's going to, you're gonna see a shark swim by from here to here, and it's gonna pause kind of in the middle and it'll point out where that little sh embryonic shark's face is. So you can go ahead. So it's right there. So you can see it's kind of sticking out. This is pretty cool. So this is the diagram of what that looks like. So um, there's just not a lot of space between the uterus, the inside of the animal, and the outside. So that's why you can kind of see it. That would not be possible in a human. <laughs> okay, so those last two examples were, um, were examples where the embryos are, are really developed by the time they're, they're born, right? They can already swim around, they're really big, they don't have a lot of predators. And that is one strategy. But there is another strategy that some other animals, particularly um, marsupials, which are a group of mammals that are found in um, Australia, including kangaroos, and they actually do kind of the opposite. So they have give birth to really underdeveloped young, really um, little joeys that can't really do anything and need to develop further outside of the uterus. So it's a little gross, but <laughs> what happens in kangaroos and wallabies and other marsupials is they are actually only pregnant for about a month. So with large animals, that's really unusual, right? You know that humans are pregnant for about nine months. Um, in kangaroos, only one month. So what happens after a month is the, um, this is what it looks like, right? After it's born. And really the only thing that's developed on these guys is kind of their upper arm strength and their sense of smell. So they are blind and they crawl their way up into the pouch and then they'll attach to um, one of the teeth and they'll just um, drink milk and develop for, uh, for many months after the fact. So they're developing for much longer outside of the uterus than they are inside the uterus. Um, and they find their way into the, into the pouch because the mother will kind of lick the area um, so that it can kind of follow that scent. Um, so this is just sort of a, uh, a view of, of what, they, what this wallaby looks like as it's developing. So this is right after it's born. This is a little bit later when it's um, still spending all of its time in the pouch, but is clearly a little bit more developed. Um, this is where it can kind of get in and out of the pouch, but it still has a bit more growing to do. And then finally, this is a wallaby that's just about ready to leave the pouch for good. Okay, so I, this, is, this is my favorite story of this talk. Um, I, I do study rodents, so I am predisposed to think that rodents are cool. But I actually, hopefully you guys think this is cool too. So. Um, these are naked mole rats, and they are very strange creatures. They um, are hairless like this, and they're almost blind because they live underground in colonies, so they don't really need to see. Um, and these guys actually have a very unusual um, system where they, they're eusocial, kind of like a, a colony of bees, right? So there's a queen, and she... Um, and she is the only one that gives birth to uh, what we call pups, baby mice, or baby rats in this case. Um, and uh, none of the other females will reproduce, and only a couple of males will contribute to that, um, to those reproductive events. So um, you can go ahead. So naked mole rats are studied for a couple of reasons, and I just kind of wanted to highlight a couple of really weird things. So. Um, house mice are, are kind of a good example of what a typical small rodent does. So these are the mice that you might find scurrying around your house. 
Um, you can go ahead. So house mice, you know, maybe in the lab they'll live for longer, but they're really not going to live much more than two years, um, especially in the wild. Naked mole rats will live for 30 years at a maximum, which is insane um, for a small rodent. So they're actually studied for, um, to understand aging. House mice are pregnant for 20 days, um, whereas naked mole rats will be pregnant for much longer, around 70 days. And then house mice will have, they'll give birth to multiple, um, multiple pups at once, and their litter size is usually about three to four. And then, you know, when they get really quite old and they've um, had a lot of babies, it'll reduce to maybe one or none. Naked mole rats, right at the beginning of the time when they become a queen and, and start reproducing, they'll produce about seven pups at one time. But what's crazy about this is that unlike most animals, um, mole rat queens will increase the amount of pups that they'll have at any given time um, across their tenure as queen. So, um, and, the, and the way that they're able to do this is that they actually get bigger. So the queen, the backbone of the queen, her skeletal system actually grows as she, um, as, when she's pregnant. Um, and it, it specifically grows in this region called the, the lumbar vertebrae, which makes sense, right? Because the, the developing pups are gonna be in her abdomen right there. So you can press next. So on the left here, these, this is a ma these two are males. This is a female that's not reproducing. And this is a female that does reproduce. You can see she's pregnant. And you can see she's like a head longer than everybody else. And she started off the same size as everybody else. Um, so long established queens will give birth to litters that are about like three times larger than when they initially started having babies. So up to 18 pups. So this is actually the same female. So this is the beginning of the study where they were doing x-rays on these mole rats. And this is the end of the study. So you can see how much bigger she got um, over this period of time. And then I just, this is amazing. This is a late stage pregnancy. She is just packed full <laughs> of pups, right? It's incredible. Um, okay, so they're so long lived, right? They can live for decades. Um, so a single female who's a queen can produce like a huge number of pups in her lifetime. Um, and so there's a, a record <laughs> for the female that was in captivity. She gave birth to over 900 pups in her lifetime and she was pregnant for, um, she was able to have, give birth over the span of about 11 years. So in 11 years, she gave birth to over 900 pups. It's crazy. Okay, so <laughs> we've talked about um, you know, different strategies that animals use to, um, to protect their embryos and help them develop right into adults. But there are a couple species that actually can switch between different modes of reproduction, um, like this angulate tortoise. So um, individuals in different years can either lay their eggs and allow them to hatch the way that many tortoises do, or they can actually retain the eggs in their bodies until they're ready to hatch. Um, and they do this when it's really hot and it helps them um, kind of regulate the temperature that that embryo in the egg is experiencing. Um, another example uh, is this uh, yellow-bellied skink. Um, I just love these guys because they look like snakes with arms. Um, and they also have different um, reproductive strategies depending on what population they're from. So individuals aren't switching back and forth, but um, these guys live in Australia and the ones that live at high altitudes in the northern part of the um, they give birth to fully formed young, so they'll keep, they keep the eggs inside their body, and the coastal individuals that are further south will lay eggs. And what's cool about this picture is these little light uh, splotches here are actually developing embryos in this skink. Okay, um, <clears throat> winged thrips, these are insects. Um, they can also switch back and forth um, between laying eggs or giving live birth. And it, depending on which strategy they choose, they will either give birth to all female offspring if they lay eggs, or, um, or all males if they um, give live birth. 
So it's kind of cool. And I want to give one more insect example um, because I think this one's also really quite interesting. So this is an aphid who's giving live birth right now. She's, well, not right now, but <laughs> whenever this photo was taken. Um, and she, and these guys are the ones that you might find infesting your house plants. And you might find, okay, I, I didn't think I had any bugs on my plants, and then I came back and suddenly there's so many. Um, and that is because they are able to reproduce really, really quickly. And they're able to do so because they do something kind of weird. So, um, you can click the next one. Okay. So, the whole cycle starts um, with a male and a female aphid producing um, a clutch of eggs. So the female will, in this first generation, lay eggs um, that will overwinter, and then they will hatch in the spring. Um, they're, the females that are produced from this egg will actually start to clonally reproduce. That means that she's just making copies of herself. So the eggs that are in her are just gonna develop in her body and she's going to um, give live birth to, um, to aphids that are identical to her. Um, and so all of her daughters are gonna keep re reproducing clonally um, all the way through the season, all the way into autumn. And um, because these eggs don't actually need to be fertilized, the, um, the embryos that are developing inside the mother are already pregnant themselves because they don't have to, um, they don't need any, and anybody else, right, to make, <laughs> to make a baby. So, um, you can do that next. So, if this is a diagram of the mom, um, then her daughter's developing inside her, and then her granddaughter is already developing inside the mom, <laughs> or the granddaughter, sorry. <laughs> So that is why they can, uh, you know, go from seemingly nothing to very, very many in such a short period of time. Okay, so I do want to return, um, I guess not return, come to humans because I think that human pregnancy is really interesting and it's actually um, pretty special what, what humans do. Um, so humans, like other placental mammals, um, like dogs and cats and cows and deer, things like that, they get nutrients from the mother's blood. So they are um, in the uterus and they're getting nutrients from the mother through a special organ called the placenta, which um, is uh, develops during pregnancy. Um, so but the thing about placentas is that they look and behave a little differently depending on what um, species you are. So although, you know, most mammals have, have placenta and, um, you know, give nutrition to their embryos this way, it's, it works a little differently. So in species like cows, um, they have multiple layers between the maternal blood flow, the veins and arteries, and the, and the fetus, the, the, or the embryo's tissue. Um, so a lot of people um, use the term fetus when they're talking about um, human development, and a fetus is just a little bit of a later stage of development. So embryo is early development when we're still making all the organs and different body parts you need, and fetal development is, a, is the, the next stage where you're growing, but you're still within the mother. So that's what I mean when I say fetus. Um, so the, so there's, if this is the mother's tissue and this is the, the fetal tissue, the, there's a lot of space um, and tissue between the maternal blood flow and the fetal blood flow. Um, and in, in other species like cats and dogs, um, the, there's a little bit less space. So the blood vessels are intact and still separate, but they're pressed up right against the fetal tissue. So there's really only one layer between the mother's body and the, the fetus's body. Um, in humans, it looks a little different. Um, in humans, there is like no separation at all. So what's going on here, um, the blue and red are just veins and arteries, and this is the mother, um, the mother's tissue, and this is the, the fetal tissue. And what's happening here is that at the beginning of pregnancy, when the embryo um, implants in the wall, so the embryo finds a space that it can develop safely, um, it will change the, the mother's um, body. <laughs> so it will actually cause the, um, 
the arteries to um, to kind of connect and um, the blood will flow directly onto the fetal tissue. So it's a really like, intimate connection between the mother's um, system and the fetus system. Uh, system. And this matters because what that means is that the mother, anything that the mother experiences, the fetus also experiences in humans. So in cows and cats and dogs, they have a little bit of control over the amount of um, nutrients they provide, the oxygen that, that gets transmitted. But in humans, it, any amount of anything in the blood that the mother is experiencing, the fetus is also experiencing. Um, and this is allows the fetus and the mother to communicate in a way, not communicate by talking, right, but communicate um, via other mechanisms. So every time the mother eats, um, the blood sugar will go up, right? Blood sugar um, is the, our main energy source. Um, that's what we get from food. And so the amount of, of blood, glucose or blood sugar, um, is going to also directly provide nutrition um, to the fetus. Um, there are, because of this intimate connection, there needs to be changes to the immune system um, so that the, the mother's body doesn't accidentally attack the, the fetus, right? Because the mother and the fetus are not totally identical. They're not the same body. And so the mother will actually have to down, um, down regulate her immune system, which is why sometimes which is why mothers can be a little more susceptible to certain, um, to certain illnesses. Um, there's also a reduction, reduction they've shown in the stress response in, in, um, pregnant, um, in pregnant humans when, um, when they're pregnant because too much stress is bad for a developing fetus. And so they'll actually reduce the overall response that they have to, to stressors. So, I think that what humans are doing is it's really quite interesting and the the degree to which the fetus and the mother can send signals back and forth is is really quite unique uh, it's shared with only um only a couple other species so we started with this kind of um these two categories right with egg laying oviparity or live bearing viviparity and we we're really kind of thinking about it in terms of, you know, something like what a chicken does, where it will lay an egg that has a shell, um, and that embryo that's developing inside that egg is really just going to get nutrition from the yolk itself. Um, or we think about something like a human, where um, the embryo is growing inside the mother, and the mother is providing all of the energy. But hopefully it's clear <laughs> now that there's a lot of variation and a lot of ways in which um, the different species can be doing something totally different. Um, so you can go ahead. So it might be more useful to think about um, modes of reproduction in terms of a spectrum. Um, so we can think about where an embryo develops, right? Um, we can think about whether it develops in an egg outside of the body, whether it develops in an egg in the in the father whether it develops in the stomach you know there's all sorts of places that that embryo can develop um or in a uterus not in an egg right um we can also think about the ways in which it receives its energy it can receive its energy from yolk deposited in the egg but it can also get it from many other places um you can go ahead. like yolk secreted from the mother unfertilized eggs that are in the uterus embryos that are in the uterus or maternal blood like we just discussed um, so with that I hope I've told you a few uh, um, a few fun um, stories tonight I'd be happy to answer any questions or elaborate on any of these animals that I talked about I think yeah and thank you so much for coming and, and listening The K in my name. Um, it's it stands for Corey, um, spelled the the Lebanese way. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, in the back. Uh, question: You're 
be happy to take you back to your uh, life. On, on the naked mole rats, what, what is your thoughts on the evolutionary reason? I know it's like these, but why you have a queen that takes on all the reproduction. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so the question is, about the mole rats and why they might have evolved this strategy of having this social system where there's one queen who's doing all of the reproduction. Um, that's a great question. I, I, don't, I don't know. So it is, um, it is pretty rare for that to be happening in, um, in a rodent or in a, a vertebrate really. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm not quite sure. I think that it's, you know, useful to have helpers around. Um, so, you know, when you're giving birth to 18 pups at once, um, you're going to need a little help to care for them, especially because rodents tend to have um, not totally helpless, but relatively underdeveloped young. So it may be a, a strategy that helps them cope with um, the amount, uh, the sheer number of pups that they're able to produce, but I don't, I don't know exactly why. But that is a great question. Yes. Uh, what animal gives the most interesting type of birth? Okay, what animal gives the most interesting type of birth? Um, <laughs> that's also a great question, and definitely a matter of personal taste. Um, <laughs> let me think about that for a second. Um, does any I mean does anyone else have one that they that they think is really fun because I'd be happy I'd be happy to <laughs> hear some other people's favorites a wasp. a wasp yeah so the uh, wasps that lay eggs and figs are are pretty cool for sure yeah they basically crawl into a fig and they can't leave again and uh, and so like their whole for some individuals their whole lives are lived like inside a fruit that's pretty cool i also it's a little gruesome but i think the species that um lay lay their eggs like on other animals <laughs> um are pretty cool and then they like yeah that's their first food source yeah some insects which lay eggs on cattles or something yeah yeah exactly yeah that's kind of gross right yeah. <laughs> yeah go ahead I think one that's interesting is the kiwi birds, which have eggs that are like almost the same size as its own body. I don't know how they give birth to that. Yeah, that's a great that's a great one. So um, the kiwi um, would lay like lays eggs that are almost as big as it is. So it's challenging. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? Yes. Yeah. Um, that's a great question. So the question is, how do the um, to the vertebrae of the naked mole rats get bigger? Um, I think, if I'm re remembering the paper correctly, I think it's um, it's that mostly the intervertebral discs that are getting bigger. Um, so I'm not positive that there's more um, bone deposition, but I could be wrong. But I think that's what it is. Um, they don't really have to go very far, so I guess <laughs> their they're spines don't need to do that. Yeah. So in a naked mole rat, if the queen dies, so like the whole colony goes with it, or uh, someone else replaces the queen? Or... Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question is, if uh, the queen dies, um, what happens to that colony of mole rats? Um, so another female will um, rise and become the queen. It's actually... Um, there's usually a lot of competition, so it'll kind of be a race to um, to kind of stake your claim to be the next queen. So the the colony won't die or, or dissipate or anything like that. They'll just a new queen will emerge. Yeah. Um, I don't think they eat something to tell them to become queen. Um, one thing that's actually, uh, but you're right that like often um, certain environmental signals or like hormonal signals will often tell um, animals in eusocial 
um, groups to do something. So I think it's just that um, once the queen is gone, they all start getting aggressive. I'm not sure if it's a hormonal cue or, or whatnot, but um, in terms of actually getting other individuals to help with um, taking care of the pups, they actually um, do that via a hormonal mechanism. So the, um, it's kind of gross, but they actually, they'll like eat the queen's poop and then that has hormonal signals that um, causes them to, to care for the pups. So if you don't let them do that, then they like won't really care for the pups. Yeah. Um, do you think that the tiger sharks having multiple babies and then one, the strongest one will eat them all? Do you think that could be like evolved as a mechanism to defend against the babies being like mutated or deformed from being from those ones being birthed? Yeah, that's a really interesting idea. So the um, the question was about the tiger sharks and whether the fact that they will have one embryo eating the rest of them, whether that might be a strategy to protect against um, the possibility of an embryo that um, that is like malformed to to be born. Um, I think that is a really interesting idea and that's possible. I don't think um, we have a solid answer of exactly why this evolved, but I, I think it's probably, um, I think it's a mixture of um, it being very advantageous or really good for those animals to be um, really developed by the time they're born. And just based on the, you know, the body plan that they had available since they are evolving from species that um, that had most of the machinery to lay an egg, um, that that was just a way in which they could achieve that. Um, but it's possible that it's um, for another reason as well, or instead of that reason. Yeah. I don't know if you know, but in that example with the sharks, where we saw them like swimming back and forth, like does, does it happen that one of them eats everything or do they still have two, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so in, I don't 100% know. I do know that they hypothesize, so they do the same thing that the sand tiger shark does where the embryo um, or the hatchling will eat all the other embryos. Um, and they were hypothesizing that perhaps this ability for them to swim around so actively helped them like hunt down their the other embryos. Um, so that was definitely part of the, the reason why they, they got this surprising result. Cause they didn't really, I don't think they came into it expecting that these um, embryos were so active. Um, in terms of whether they have two or one typically, I don't know. From that video, it would seem like there was only one. Um, so it's possible that that's the the mode of reproduction there, especially because there is that gap where they can get from one uterus to another. And my, I my I would imagine that if it can access that other uterus, then there will be some sort of duking it out um, situation. So that would be my guess, but I don't know for sure. All right, thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, Sam, that was wonderful, thank you. Uh, next month, we're out here April 14th, and we'll have plant identification for everybody. And that should be pretty solid. So we'll see how that goes. <laughs> Thanks again for coming out, and we'll see y'all next time. Have a good night.